18. Genesis 18, 1 8. We're going to read at verse 16, 1 6. Genesis chapter 18, and beginning at verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. And Abram walked along with them to see them on their way. And then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have known him, that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will not. The man turned away and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? <coughs> Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. <coughs> then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five or less than the 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? The Lord said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there. The Lord answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. Abraham said, Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only twenty can be found there? He said, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. And Abraham said, May the Lord not be angry. But let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? The answer, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham returned home. Two years ago, it was British Telecom that made popular the little slogan, It's Good to Talk. And of course, the more that we talked, the more money they made. <laughs> but there is some truth in it, isn't it? It is good to talk. In fact, probably most difficulties in relationships, most breakdowns in relationships come about because we don't talk. Or we don't talk enough. But then talking involves listening as well as speaking. So maybe sometimes it's we don't listen enough. So there's good advice within that. The exciting thing that we read about here in Genesis 18 is that as friends of God, we can talk with God. And it doesn't cost us a penny either. 
In fact, the more we talk, the more blessed we are, not the more poor we become. And this is an expression of the friendship between God and Abraham. That they talk with one another in this way. In Abraham's prayer, we, we see that he prays for others. That's the first thing that he does. He prays for others. He prays for his family. Because remember, Lot and his family were now living in the city of Sodom. They had left Ur together. They had moved on from Haran together. They had come into a land where God had said, This is the land I'm giving you. But because they began to grow in number, and the number of their sheep increased, the number of their cattle increased, they needed to separate. And Lot had chosen the area near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because the land was green. There was water there. It looked to be the best place. So Lot said, I'll have that. And Abraham, the older man, allows him to go. Trusting God to provide for him. And so now when he comes to this situation where he hears news about disaster coming upon Sodom, Abraham shows absolutely no sign of resentment towards Lot. He bears no grudge against Lot for having chosen the better place. He wishes no harm upon him, but rather he prays for him. And prays that he may know God's mercy and God's rescue. And it's important for us to pray for our families. I hope we do that often. I hope we do that week by week. I'm sure we pray for our children, for their schooling, for work, for their friendships, for their health. But do we pray for them to become men and women of faith? Young men and women who will receive God's salvation, who grow up to be strong in Him, wanting to serve Him in and through everything. Hopefully we pray for our parents. Maybe for some of us our parents are getting to older years. Sometimes they just need some patience. When for the third time in ten minutes they ask the same question and seem to have forgotten the answer that they want. We need to pray for them. For God to bless them and to be with them. It's important for us, like Abraham, to pray for our families. If we're married, to pray for our husband or our wife. But also to make sure we pray for those who are single, who never loved. Those who have not yet married. Or those who never married. Or those who have been bereaved. Because there are challenges that they live with. We need to remember in our prayers. But Abraham not only prays for his family, he actually prays for all of the people of that city. Both the righteous and the wicked. Clearly he prays for the righteous. Lord, if there are 50 there, will you destroy that city? Or will you rescue it for their sake? And I think Abraham also has a concern even for those who he would describe as the wicked. Those who do not fear God. Those who just do their own thing. Those who deliberately sin against God. And yet here we find Abraham doesn't point a finger at them. God, he doesn't say to God, well, I'm glad you're going to punish that city because they deserve it. Rather, he prays for them. He prays for the city to be saved. He prays for God to have mercy. His prayers extend to all. 
And so too, our prayers. It's good that we pray for our family. It's good that we pray too for our church that we're part of. That we pray for one another. I meant to bring one of the green books here that just says, you know, we have so many names of one another here. There's no reason for us to forget one another. Because our names are all printed here. Or at least many of them. Do we pray for each other? We pray for each other when we know people are going into work the next day. Do we pray for one another when we know someone is not well? Do we pray for each other when we know we're facing an important decision? Do we pray for those who are on their own? Important that we pray for one another. But also that we pray for the church around the world. Especially when we pray for the persecuted church. And we're going to receive news from Open Doors, the Baptist Missionary Society, Release International, and I could go on. No reason why we shouldn't pray for the church around the world. But also for those who don't believe in the Lord. Do we pray for them too? Do we pray with the compassion and the boldness with which Abraham prayed? Maybe there are members of your own family who don't know the Lord yet. Maybe colleagues at work. Maybe the people that live in the house next door or the flat upstairs or the lab. How do we feel about them? How do we pray for them? Because friends of God talk with and we talk with God about everyone and everything. Because we can. The second thing I want you to see how Abraham prays with his heart. The end of the prayer in verse 32. He says, Lord, please don't be angry with me. Let me speak just once more. See, Abraham was already asked five times, Lord, well, if there are 50, if there's five less than 50, if there's 40, 30, 20, and then he says, Lord, just one more time. Please, let me ask one more thing. He's praying from his heart. You see, Abraham has learned something about these cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we find in verse 20 that the Lord speaks. In the beginning of this chapter, there were three visitors whom Abraham welcomed and to whom he showed hospitality. And as the three of them get up to leave, Abraham goes with them. And then two of them go on down to the city of Sodom. And so one is left remaining. And throughout the chapter, he's given that name, Lord. As Anka said last week, it's what theologians would call a theophany. An appearance of God before the time of the incarnation. And so it is the Lord who stands before Abraham. And he speaks. And says, I'm going to go down and have a look at Sodom. It's almost as if the other two have gone and I'm going to go in a moment as well. And I'm going to go and I'm going to see just what is going on there. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that the Lord didn't know. The Lord knows all things. But what we need to understand is that if God is going to bring judgment, he wants us to understand that it's not done rashly, quickly, but done very thoughtfully. And done as the last resort. And so as the Lord speaks about that city and its wickedness and what he is planning to do, it's as if the Lord is inviting Abraham to respond. I don't think the Lord is talking to himself in verse 20, 21. The other two have gone. The Lord is there. 
Abraham is there. And as the Lord speaks, I think he intends Abraham to hear. And as Abraham hears, it is an invitation to the friend of God to respond to what he hears. And Abraham responds with his heart. In verse 23, we're told that he approached the Lord. So Abraham had always been standing just a little distance away, near enough to hear when the Lord speaks. But now as Abraham begins to speak, he comes near. He draws near because he comes to the Lord when he comes to one who is his friend. He comes in order to open up his heart. To be completely honest and free in what he says to his friend. And we too have that same privilege. Ephesians 3, it says that in Christ and through faith in him, we may approach God with boldness and with confidence. This is what Abraham does here. He doesn't just speak a few words. He speaks from his heart. There's nothing routine or ritual about what he does here. It's not a going through the motions. It's something that comes from his heart. First, because he comes near to a friend. But secondly, because he really cares. First of all, for Lot and his family, but also for all of the people of that city. He keeps asking. And at the end he says, Lord, would you let me speak just, just one more time? Just once more. Because of his life. His compassion. His care. And we see something similar in other parts of the scriptures. In Exodus 32, you'll find that God says to Moses that he is going to just wipe out the people of Israel. And Moses almost seems to say to God, Lord, you can't do that. Not quite in so many words. But what he does go on to say is, Lord, if you're not going to forgive them, then block me out also. And you think, what? What is he saying there? How can he pray like that? We find it too in, in the story of Elisha. Do you remember in, in uh, the accounts we read of Elisha, there's uh, that uh, woman, the Shunite woman, who uh, builds a special room for Elisha. So when Elisha comes that way, he can stop, he can rest, he can have something to eat, to drink, he can uh, prepare his next message, he can pray, he can do whatever he wants to. He is at home there. And that woman has a young son. And one day that son dies. And she sends for Elisha. And Elisha realizes that she is in trouble and that she is upset. And he gives his staff to uh, his, his assistant and says, go with her. See what it is. And the man goes and he realizes the boy has died and he, he seems to just pray. But when Elisha arrives and the boy is still dead, he goes up to that room, he shuts the door and he begins to pray. And when nothing happens, he that's a really strange, odd kind of thing. He gets on the bed with the boy, or the young man. And he prays again. When we read that and we think, what an odd thing to do. Eventually what happens is that prayer is answered. The boy comes back to life. You see, that was a prayer that came from his heart. It wasn't enough just to say, Look, would you be able to restore this boy to life? There was something that comes deep from within here. And in some ways it doesn't matter exactly what the words are, it's what comes from here that is actually more important. And I hope as you hear those 
different stories. You don't think it sounds that crazy. I hope you don't think they're thinking, well, that's a bit extreme, or that's way over the top. Because here were men who were moved deep within. They prayed with compassion. With real love for the people that they were praying for. It challenges our prayers, or rather it challenges our hearts. Is, is that where our hearts are? Prayer, I think, would be so much easier if we really remember that actually it's drawing near to the Lord. I mean, is that not the greatest privilege imaginable? Yeah. So if we remembered that, if we began our praying, Lord, thank you that I can come to you this morning. I actually haven't said, well, I feel really tired, I've got a sore throat, I really don't want to get out of bed this morning, but I can come near to you. Imagine yeah. the change that that would make within us. And then to begin to pray from within here for our family, our friends, the work that we have to do that day. Abraham prays with his heart because that's what friends of God do. Abraham also prays with great boldness. That, I think, is fairly clear and obvious to us. But Abraham makes it plain. Verse 22, now that I've been so bold, as to speak to the Lord, even though I am just thus ashes. Yet Abraham is very bold, beginning at 50. Then I love the way he puts it, five less than that. Look, not very many. Still enough, isn't it? And then the number comes down, and it comes down, and it comes down. There is great boldness there as well as great compassion. It's the kind of boldness that Jesus talks about when he says, imagine uh, someone who has a friend comes at midnight. It's late to be arriving, but that's the time that they arrive. And so you want to open the door, you want to welcome them in. And what do you want to do? You want to give them a sandwich. Fortunately, everything's gone. So you, you decide you'll put on your slippers and put a coat on and you'll go and knock on the next door. And you'll say, friend, neighbour, please, I, I need a little help because a friend of mine has come and I don't have anything to give them. The neighbour says, go away. But the neighbour says, shut up, you'll wake the children. Jesus concludes the parable, doesn't he? He says, look, even if he won't get up because he is a friend, because the man keeps on asking, because he is so bold, because he is actually quite shameless in asking, he will give to you. The old English word was importunity. I mean, I can't find a very good explanation in any dictionary online that really puts that into simple words. They use other complicated words that leave me none the wiser as to what it means. But it seems to have a combination of not being ashamed to us and asking because we are in need. And those two things make us bold before God. Compassion linked with boldness. But boldness doesn't mean that we lack respect. Doesn't we go in, mean that we go in and just demand something of God? There is somehow within Abraham boldness and respect. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, even though I am but dust, Ashes. Great thoughts of the Lord, the one to whom he speaks. Great humility in thinking about himself. I'm just dust and ashes. So that's what will become of me sooner or later. And yet, this pile of dust and ashes in this form of the moment comes and says, Lord, I want to ask you. So there's boldness and yet also 
still deep in his heart. So Abraham is praying for others. He's praying with compassion in his heart. He's praying with great boldness and yet with respect. But did you notice how the chapter ended? Chapter ended, verse 32, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham. I know that's verse 17, and then we'll come to that in a moment. But the chapter ends when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham. You know, I, I remember growing up as a child and being told, the Lord speaks to us as we read the scriptures and we speak to him in prayer. And there's truth within that. But I venture to suggest it's not the whole truth. Because here, the Lord speaks with Abraham. I wonder if you've ever thought of prayer in that kind of way. See, it can be. See, the reason that Abraham, the Lord speaks to Abraham is found in verses 17 and 18. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to keep that. I'm, I'm going to share that with him. Why? Because I know him. Because he's my friend. Now, we need to be very careful with that in thinking about how the Lord speaks to us today. You know, sometimes people can get very either worried about it or they can get very over-enthusiastic about it. And almost any idea that comes to mind, they think that God is speaking to them. Probably more likely is we read this and we think, I'd love to hear from God when I pray. And actually, we really, really want that. We're not quite sure how it's going to happen. The way it happens for Abraham is that the Lord is standing there. It's this theophany. So on this occasion, Abraham can see the Lord and clearly hear the Lord. That may not be our experience today, but I'm still convinced that the Lord does speak to us because the Lord makes us aware of things. You know, we have tea together and we're chatting and somebody tells me something and I think, I ought to pray about that, you know. Whatever it is they're going to do tomorrow, whatever situation it is they're facing, they shared something of their life with me. That's a great privilege. And actually it's an invitation to, to pray. Because it's not the Lord speaking to us through that conversation, making us see what is happening there. Other times, truly, we will be reading the scriptures, and as we read a certain verse, we will read something, and you know what? We'll think of somebody. Somebody in our family, somebody in our workplace, somebody within church. Why have we just suddenly thought about that person as we've read that verse? You know, maybe the Lord is wanting to prompt us actually to use that verse to pray for that person. So I really do believe the Lord does speak to us. But we need to be thoughtful and careful in understanding that. And pray for wisdom to know when it's just our own thoughts and imagination. And to know when truly it is the Lord. But as we look at this passage here, I want to say to us, come on, let's be a people of prayer. Let's pray, not just with our heads, which is good, but with our hearts, which is really important. Let's be like Abraham. Let's pray with boldness. Let's be bold in what we ask God for. And like Abraham, let's be those who listen. Let's talk. Because friends talk. And we are called friends of God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you give us your word to encourage us, to challenge us, to inspire us, to help us. We ask this morning that the example of Abraham's friendship and his prayer will do all of that. Pray that it will inspire us again with a new desire to go deeper in prayer with you. I pray that it will uh, challenge us to be more faithful in prayer. I pray that it will help us to think about the way that we pray and that like him, we may talk and listen, because through Jesus Christ you have made us 
your friends, and we thank you for that. 